Hey guys, Zach with Max Body Armor. Today I want to get into a subject with you guys relevant to rifle setup with particular focus on white lights. Taking some baselines here first with particular focus on rifle setup in general, whether you go LPVO or some form of red dot, just iron sights or an LPVO with some form of reflex optic with that as well. You have sighting systems, you have a white light, and you have a sling with some form of backup sight, preferably iron sights, whether they are fixed, like you have here with these Scalar Works, or MBUS Pros that are flip up, whatever the case may be. But those are some musts as far as a baseline for a couple of reasons, which is Electronics can fail, uh, mechanical items can fail, anything that can happen will happen sort of thing. So you wanna have backup iron sights to whatever main optic you are running on your rifle, unless you are only running irons, then you're pretty much good. But I'm sure you could find a way to break those as well. Then the white light is very important for identification of targets and potential threats, I would say, in following basic rules of firearm safety, right? So knowing your target and what's beyond it. If you can't see it, how could you know your target or what's beyond it? So simple things like that, I know that seems rudimentary to some, but that's kind of what we're after here is the basic baseline. So optic, whatever your preference is, there are arguments and uses for both, red dot or LPVO or some kind of combination of the like, along with backup iron sights. Then the sling is there for firearm retention, just like a handgun has a holster, the sling is the holster for a long gun, whether that is a rifle or a shotgun. As simple as it gets, if you need your hands in an emergency situation, but you still need to have the rifle with you, the sling is quite helpful. You don't have to set down the rifle, you just sling it up. Your hands are now available to you and whoever else may need them. So starting with that baseline and those assumptions, where do we go from there? With particular focus on the white light. White light is assumed without all the other items that you could have, night vision, thermal, IR stuff, just going with white light as a baseline because a lot of us who are running rifles don't necessarily have the, the budget allocated for night vision or thermal devices, nor maybe even see a reason for having those implements for any reason whatsoever. Without having those systems in your lineup, we're assuming white light as, as the basis. From there, there are about two or three schools of thought that I have gleaned from my experience of seeing what other people do, uh, whether that's online, is not really practically tested in some ways. It's hard for you to know if you haven't gone out and spent the money, taken the time to do some form of professional rifle courses from validated and accredited people. A lot of times I think a lot of people being new to that, uh, the gun community, if you would say, and firearms, that they would just copy what they see without understanding exactly why the person is set up that way, what actually works in a practical setting. Getting into that a little bit further with my personal preference, you have to look at this experience is evolutionary. A lot like any other analogy you could see in life, your viewpoints evolve over time, or possibly should for uh, improvement purposes, growth, whatever you wanna say, intelligence, experience gained, all of that stuff. Whatever drove you to purchase the firearm, the first firearm, going back to that first firearm, as you evolve in skill set acquisition, as you train more, as you look at practical applications, you might determine, wow, this, this firearm, whether it's a handgun, a rifle, a shotgun, whatever, is rounds limited meaning it doesn't have a high enough capacity for potentially multiple threads, or it's too heavy and uncomfortable to carry in my EDC, or whatever that may be. And, and some of you will obviously even have opinions about carrying firearms is not supposed to be comfortable, so don't even, you know, there's all these different things that you can do, and a lot of this stuff is personal opinion, and you get into a little bit of difficulty there without a lot of experience on the practical side. So that's why practicality is important. With that in mind, when I first set up a rifle, I may have done it differently. I may, in two years from now, change it further. But being at the place that I am currently, I'm gonna show you my preference, which you'll see 
in this example here, uh, which I'll get into for the white light, which this is a Surefire Scout 340C Pro, that even as a right-handed shooter, I prefer to have no pressure pad for activating the light. I just want to activate like this, maintaining control over the firearm and staying in the sights and doing all that, while not ever accidentally just through excitement, you know, assuming that you're using this in some kind of defensive scenario, your heart rate's up, fine motor skills may be waning. It's, it stands to reason to me because I've done it in practice and in training that I've activated that light without intending to do so. And it is a training point. Perhaps I could train that out and just keep, keep on using pressure pads um, or, or buttons up here or, or tape or whatever I might have to engage the light and, and get, the, get rid of the tail cap situation. But when you have multiple platforms, different applications, you know, the LPVO versus uh, the uh, red dots, whether that's EOTech EXPS3 here, this one to four, or this Trigicon MRO, I have different tools for different jobs. But what I like to do is keep them the same. The more things are the same, the simpler it is. Whichever one I pick up, whether it's a 308 or 556, when I pick it up, if I have them all set up the same way, there's no new manual of arms to like remember which one I'm holding as if I were to jump from a Beretta to a Glock where there's a different manual of arms in terms of making the gun go bang or doing what I needed to do and doing that quickly. So one of the things I kind of got away from was what a lot of people do that are right-handed shooters pre predominantly is they'll have the light set up on the right side of the gun. I don't do that. I have it where my left hand can en engage the tail cap. And that is specifically because these are always recessed, whether it's a um, Streamlight uh, ProTac HLX, uh, it's a thousand lumen light. This is 500 lumen, <clears throat> whatever it is. There's a couple cloud defensives on the table here. We have the rain micro here, uh, as well as uh, this is the owl. Uh, this is on uh, set up on the right side and I'll get into that here in a second. But generally speaking, I have these always on the tail cap like this and the tail cap is recessed. So you, you, whenever you hit this light, usually it's very intentional. It's very hard not to, even if you do the temporary engagement and then turn it back off just lightly. It's very simple. One digit is required to activate it. My non-dominant hand is engaging that while I'm still on the controls of the rifle and able to focus on that. And it's a very simple method. And from one platform to the next, I have the same setup. So left side, tail cap, left side, tail cap, left side, tail cap. And you know, this foregrip, so my location's always referenced and indexed. I'm never really off that even in a reduction of fine motor skills and heart rate being at 230. Activate that light when I need it and not activate it when I don't because there would be obvious reasons why that would be a security issue in terms of identifying my location with this bright white light when I don't want to. So that's essentially what I've done uniformly across several different platforms, regardless of what the optic is or the, the irons are or whatever, that white light setup is my preferred method for every light that most people would have a pressure pad for. This does get into other things. You'll have some shadow and we'll do some cut-ins here of some footage so I can demonstrate that to you guys. But essentially the lights that you have on your firearms and there are some other tools to um, offset some of those issues, whether or not you're running a can, but you'll have some shadow depending on where the light location is and the end of the muzzle devices and or suppressor, whatever that may be hanging off the end here of your uh, rifle that does create some issues, which is another thing for me that made sense to have the rifle on the left side. Going back to these baseline conversation is that when I'm running a defensive platform, such as an AR-15 or uh, this Galil or some kind of variant of the like, I'm tending to practice shooting with both eyes open and intending to fully do that all the time. So that is for defensive purposes necessary because of identification of threat. So you have white light on and if something comes from my left side, my left eye is open, I can see it coming. Because I'm right-handed, I wanna know about that information 
as quickly as possible and I'm not as concerned with shadow on the right side because my right eye is really trained on the optic and focus there because it is my dominant eye, even though both eyes are open and I'm shooting both eyes open, so I'm engaging. Boom, 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 boom. Something comes from the left. I can see it because the light is over here and I have no shadows on the left side. Light set up on this side, the shadow from the muzzle device or suppressor would be cast from the right to the left on my off eye where I where something in, could come out of that shadow and harm me that I wouldn't identify quickly enough. I know we're dealing with a lot of theory here, but just bear with me. So on that basis, it also validates, in my opinion, setting up on the left side. So now I'm illuminating to the left and it is more natural, even with a small shadow on the right from the muzzle device and or suppressor, that if I do get a threat from the right, I am going to turn into that a lot easier than a delayed reaction to something I'm turning to my weak side on, depending on the structure, location, area that I'm uh, operating in, whether it's my home or what have you, that's that consideration as well. So that is another point validates in my mind this setup is that I'm, I've got the offside covered, well lit, and as I'm doing some form of defense or engagement, as I'm advancing or staying stationary, it is more natural to pan to my dominant side thereby the shadow would be moving and I would be illuminating that direction as I moved more easily into that, it would be much faster. This is what I've identified and this is why I've felt comfortable setting up literally 95% of my platforms in this manner to be able to engage with my off hand, which is my left, and for those reasons, it makes the most sense. Then going back to keeping everything the same, to keep it simple across these platforms, no matter what I pick up, that's the way that all my rifles are run. Keeping things more the same is better because in high stress situations, having to think through like which gun is in my hand or what am I doing, that's, that's time and, and precious time at that point that you know maybe some of the better part of your thinking is not operational or in the best possible state of mind, whatever. Um, there's obviously stressful things happening. You know, we've all had some form of that and we know that we don't think as clearly during those types of situations. Now to go to other setups, following different, that different line of thought, there are systems that you can set up to advance your light on the right side far enough forward that you don't get that shadow. In this case, with this muzzle device, uh, from the right side, operating the same exact way that I was talking about, both eyes open. This is a MRO patrol here. Engage, and both eyes are open. We're okay, we're okay. And we don't have as much shadow, so that kind of handles that argument. Now, this is also a pressure pad uh, setup that I wouldn't normally run on my gear, but I mean, it does feel nice, it works fine. This is cloud defensive with a Surefire pad and then a Surefire Scout on here, so, and this um, bar has got us so far, this is an Arasaka T-Rex arms, this got us so far forward that you're losing some of that shadow until a can goes on, and this is a uh, dead air break, um, so, that is gonna be having a shadow as soon as you put the can on, even if you put a, a Sandman K on there, which is a very short can, uh, just over five inches, that will then obviously get you a nice shadow on that off eye side. So my preference is not to do that based on the reasons I just explained to you. There are different ways to do it. You'll have this setup here. So this LWRC has fixed irons, EXPS3, uh, EOTech. The fixed irons are ScalarWorks. There is a IR laser illuminator up here, and then a very similar setup on the Surefire Scout, where we have a cloud defensive set up here with the Surefire pressure pad, and then this advanced bar here from T-Rex Arms and uh, Arasaka. Again, this three-prong flash hider is a dead air muzzle device, and it is made to be suppressed, so again, we'll have that shadow. We have the pressure pad on the side on this setup, to where this will engage this way. Definitely still workable. Uh, I think that, you know, intentional activation light, this is just a training point for whoever has this preference of setup, but 
This is a, de a different way of doing it. You will still have some of that shadow that I was talking about, especially once the uh, can or suppressor's on there. You know, the pad's on the side and, and perhaps you can do some different things here to keep you off of that until you wanna be on there for the similar reasons that I was discussing. And there are several different ways to uh, accomplish the same goal, but that is a different setup with a much different way of engaging this where it's in the same grip area, but now they can work their laser as well. That's a different way of doing it too. So we'll get that back out here. We have another one here, um, right side setup, pressure pad, BRN 180 here from Brownells and uh, Core Elite, Trigicon, MRO, Patrol, similar setup. Again, we have uh, Surefire here too, same thing, uh, different, Pressure pads, a little more advanced. This is also shorter, so you have less area to do things anyway. So we're kind of gonna end up in this area with my preferred grip here. I do like this hand stuff, not sure who makes that. It's very nice. Again, muzzle device, suppressor. We will have shadow on that left side for, for what I was discussing here, but still a pretty nice setup. It's just a matter of training that in and making sure that you're not gonna engage that when you don't want to and I'm sure it's something that can be practiced. That is another way to do it as well. So we have it top side here too. Generally speaking, the overarching theory here, or the overarching concept that we want to uh, present to you guys is play around with it, find out what works for you, get some good information from reliable sources as to why, then practice that and see what works well for you and what you can and cannot do. And some people don't have so many different tools, so they're not gonna be jumping from platform to platform, but a lot of people I think do, from what I've seen in all my experience and the guys that I do classes with and, and train with and, and so forth. So there are also different reasons to have different setups if you're trying to do some form of clone from the military and or, uh, a lot of these video games or different reasons, movies, you wanna have your setup that way because that's how it is, uh, period correct or you know correct in the film or the game, like I said, then go ahead and do that, but practice and train with it so that you're solid on it because you're only gonna be as good as your worst level of training in a high stress situation, that's what you're gonna resort back to. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're above all training, dry firing, um, I know ammunition, it has uh, gone nuclear in recent times, uh, was getting better and then things happened and uh, nothing surprises us anymore after the last couple of years. So basically being overall prepared with the gear and tools that you have, being intelligent about your purchases and your acquisitions for reliability and your general purpose and philosophy of use so that you have something that's set up well for your abilities and so forth. I have a lot of red dots. I have really good vision. I know for myself that 300 to 320 yards with a 5.56 with a red dot, I'm fairly decent on a man-sized target or you know torso-sized target, eh, even off the flat range and on the move and different things like that. You do get to know yourself in training and what your capabilities are, like I said, with my vision or so forth. So you wanna know, should I have an LPVO? Do I need that magnification? Who's the best out there with, you know, one to six, one to eight, one to 10? You know, there's been a lot of exciting things that have happened with that type of optic in the last uh, several years. Just having that overall stuff nailed down before you go out and just duplicate what you've seen, because a lot of this stuff looks cool. Everything looks cool. I mean, that's that's a big part of it for a lot of people is it's just it looks awesome, you know, and I wanna, I wanna have that. Well, that's good, but practicality, what does that look like from a from a use standpoint? Where are you at? Sometimes a 20 inch AR makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. And you need to think about your operational environment where you would use it. And as a defensive tool, what what is the um, what is the actual purpose that we're going for and and, and when are you most likely to have it on you and use it and so forth? And then just replicating those scenarios and then getting to a place where you can train where you're not shooting just on the flat range where you're doing some things that get your heart rate elevated get you some funny angles that are very difficult does the rifle still function this way and that's where you start to get the real fine-tuned tweaks of wow i can't really run it this way because when i lay on my right side and i start plinking 
that doesn't work or whatever the thing may be. Getting and, and finding those things out when you can get to the, uh, some good training and when you can uh, get the ammo through the gun, that's good. And then otherwise dry firing and running through your, you know, running through some scenarios with all of the equipment you have on your rifle that makes sense. And I think keeping it simple is important, keeping it, uh, you know, as minimal as possible. Doing some longer, longer term courses is good with a lot of gear. So you get to hold your rifle for long periods of time and understand, you know, maybe this is a little too heavy. Uh, I should rethink this setup. Maybe I should go with a lighter light or a lighter optic, or this is not really necessary and, and keep the stuff off the gun that doesn't need to be there and just kind of getting into those places and, and finding out what works for you. So definitely let us know in the comment section what your preferences are, what you like, what you don't like, what your setup is. Also check out maxbodyarmor.com. Uh, all our armor's in stock. We guarantee shipping with 14 days or less. And I uh, wanna set you guys up if you're uh, needing some armor. Stay safe out there, guys.